delighted that you have gathered with us in worship on this glorious day in which we come to celebrate the joy of this season. As we gather, we want to extend a special welcome to our guests, our college students who are starting to come home for the season, and for most especially those also worshiping online. As we gather this morning, let us center with a word of prayer. Almighty and gracious God, as we continue in our season of Advent and enter into worship, we are reminded that we are called to rejoice in your good news. In you, the sinner is forgiven, the brokenhearted are comforted, the captive set free, the old made new. You continue to deliver us from darkness as we experience your mercy and grace again and again. O oh God, renew our joy this season over the great things you've accomplished for our benefit and your glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue in worship as we lift our voices in song. from Isaiah 12, 2 through 6. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has, he has become my salvation. 
With joy you will draw from the wells of salvation. You will say on that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord, for he has done graciously. Let this be known in all the earth, should aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the one, is the Holy One of Israel. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our joy. May the joyful promise of your presence, O God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Awesome opportunity this morning to update you on our end of year financial uh, situation, opportunity, uh, if you will. And the headline is it's, it's really good news. Uh, we have a little ground to make up, but we can do it together. Uh, so, first, I want to talk about a little bit about end of year and then look ahead to 2024 together. So, first, 2023. We have just under $790,000 to raise between now and 11.59 p.m. on December 31st. Uh, but here's how it breaks down. 233,000 is anticipated from pledged giving and 566,000 is anticipated from non-pledged giving. Now, how does this break out? So pledged giving is those who have made a pledge as part of our One Together campaign for 2023. And non-pledged is anyone who hasn't made a pledge or anyone who has but gives over and above the pledged amount, all of that goes into non-pledged giving. So you begin to see this is doable and, and we're making great progress toward the end of the year. So I wanted to celebrate that together. And the headline here really is that every gift matters, every person matters, and you are really an important part of the work that we all do together. So that's 2023. Let's look ahead now to 2024, our Multiply Stewardship Campaign. Just want to give you a brief update here. Uh, now recall, as part of Multiply, we're combining general ministry and mission into one fund. And so we're looking to be able to continue funding everything we're doing for the total to be a combination of both, essentially, what we've done in 23, combining the 24. So here's where we are. To date, we have received 167 pledges toward 2024, totaling approximately $1.8 million. So how does this compare to this year? Overall, we've received 219 pledges this year to general ministries, totaling $2 million, and 142 pledges to missions, totaling $270,000. So if you're doing the math in your head, to do what we did this year, we need an additional 52 pledges representing $460,000 in giving. The good news is we're right where I would expect to be at this time in the year. Many people wait until end of year, the very beginning of the next, to see kind of how everything shook out with you know, income taxes and all of that. And, and then many make their pledge for the current year after the calendar changes. But I do want to give you this update, and this really matters. So we either have to, because of kind of increases in fixed expenses due to inflation. And right now, where we're tracking with that non-pledged revenue, we need to make up $300,000 to be able to fund everything that we're currently doing into next year. So we're, we do that one of two ways. One, you know, we, we see that non-pledged revenue number uh, for this year come in, right? Because the best predictor that we have of giving next year is how we end the year this year. So that's one. Or we need to find an additional $300,000 in pledges over and above what we did this year for next year. And so what that would 
mean is that we, we would ri raise the amount of pledges outstanding to 760,000. And my goal would be to increase that 219 pledges to 250. So we still have some work to do. God can do anything, right? And I think as we have faith in God and we all do what we can, and we step out in faith and give generously, God will do exceedingly and abundantly far more than we could even ask or imagine. And so if you are a visual person like me and I just sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, wah, 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 there's great news. In your e-news from last Friday, everything I just said is there. So you can look it up, you can read it, and if you have any questions, reach out anytime. And if you'd like to make a pledge, you can do so today. There are some pledge cards for Multiply at the Welcome Desk outside to the left, or you can pledge anytime online at fmhouston.com backslash multiply. Thank you all for your generosity and faithfulness, and thank you for being the church. Now, I always have to follow a financial update with even something more sparkly and spectacular than that, and so we've invited Alexis to come and talk to us about the Lifeline Christmas Luncheon. Good morning, church family. Um, as Lance said, I'm Alexis McCarty, and I run our Lifeline to the Homeless ministry. Um, this ministry has been serving men and women living on the straight streets in our church, uh, near our church, for over 25 years. And so First Methodist remains committed to serving our homeless friends. Uh, our volunteers work directly with nearly 100 people each week. Um, hygiene, food, and clothing are the tangible items we provide, but the more meaningful gifts include offering a smile, speaking with kindness, and providing refuge where they have an opportunity just to sit and rest and have a cup of coffee. Um, we do have some great uh, volunteer opportunities. So this Thursday, the 14th, is our annual Christmas luncheon where we serve them a holiday meal in the fellowship hall. So we would love to have you come out and help us with that. Um, you can sign up on the website, there's a link. Um, we also need just weekly volunteers. So we're open on Mondays and Wednesday mornings. Um, reach out to me if you would be interested in doing that. Um, and then we also always need donated items. So these hundred people that we see, right, every week. So we're always giving out clothing, uh, hygiene items. So if you're able to help us with those things, and right now during this cold season, we really need a warm item. So thank you. In preparation for the party this coming week, it's my understanding that the family advent group last week and all of that celebration assembled close to 200 uh, hygiene bags that will be given out this next week. So all of the children and families who are a part of that, thank you for that incredible act of service. At this time, I want to invite our ushers to come forward for the giving of our tithes and offerings. As they do, we come and bring our whole selves to worship. And so we want to encourage you to fill out the registration pads and pass those down if you have not had that opportunity so that we can stay in communication with you offering our ministries throughout the year. Let us pray. Generous and loving God, you have given us all that we have and all that we are. We thank you for the opportunity to respond to your love and generosity by sharing our gifts with one another and those around the globe. Let our hearts sing with joy as we work with you to bring unshakable joy to our world. As we prepare for the coming of your Son, may our lives proclaim your good news for all throughout the earth. It's in your Son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus. 
remain standing, let us affirm our faith together as we share in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he arose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and seated the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. to come down for a children's moment with Miss Courtney. All right, guys. Now, as, as the big kids are coming back from college, if you're feeling nostalgic, feel free to join me. I see some faces in there that haven't been here in a while. Awesome. So I'm going to put the congregation on the spot this morning. If you feel brave, you can answer, and if you don't want to, nobody will know. They'll just think you'll have a good skin care routine. How many in the audience are 70 years or older? Okay, now don't fact check me on this, but I read somewhere that if you are 70 years or older, you, are gonna spend, you have already spent about three years of your life just waiting. So you could extrapolate downward and do the math to kind of figure out with y'all's age how much time in your life you have spent waiting. You might have been waiting in line at the grocery store or waiting at the doctor's office or waiting for lunch to be ready or waiting for a recess to start at school, right? Have you ever seen this book before? It's called, Oh, the Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. And in this story, he talks about a place called the waiting place. And he describes it as a useless place where people are just waiting, waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or a no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really like waiting. How do you feel about it? I'm not very patient. But I don't really know any way to avoid it. And if you figure it out, please email me after church today. Now, uh, we all have to spend some time in this waiting place that Dr. Seuss talks about. But I don't think that it has to be a useless place, like he says. While we are waiting, what happens? Life goes on, right? And we must make really good use of our time. So what could we do? What do you like to do while you're waiting for something? Other things such as doing something on a screen like a computer or tablet. Okay, what else? Do you like to read a book? Or maybe you're one of those people who wakes up and sits down and writes a list of the things they need to do. Or you could do your homework or study for a test, right? Maybe I, did. Maybe I went a little too far on that one. Uh, but there's a lot of things we can do besides waiting. So we are still in the season of Advent, which means to come. So what's coming soon? 
Christmas, right? Of course it's coming and it's such an exciting time and it can be really hard to wait for, right? Especially when you know that there's presents waiting for you. Um, waiting for that day that you can finally open the gifts. Some gifts might be starting to appear under the tree. But what can we do to make this time of waiting for Christmas more than just a useless waiting? So we could think about the true meaning of Christmas. Think about Jesus, right? We could do things like help at Lifeline or Neighbors in Action parties or packs, um, bags for hygiene kits or all kinds of things. We can think about giving instead of receiving during this time. And so when we do those things, we find joy in the waiting places instead of being stuck in useless waiting places. So we're waiting for Christmas, but we're also waiting for something else. We are waiting for Jesus to return to us. And he told us that he was going to come again, and he told us to watch and be ready. And so that's what this time of year reminds us of. And so while we're waiting for Jesus to return, we can worship and praise him like we're doing this morning. We can love and serve him, and we can share his love with other people, even when we're stuck in that waiting time. When we're doing these things, we'll be ready for him to come, and we will find joy in the waiting place instead of feeling useless. So let's pray this morning and ask God to help us make useful of our time that we're waiting. God, we thank you for the waiting. We hope that you can help us to find joy and peace and love and hope during all of these times. Please use us to make our waiting time a place that we can love others and serve others. In your name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for our scripture reading. Today's text comes from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4, 
and 8 through 11. Listen now for a word from the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display His glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I have waited my entire ministry to say this. What this service needs is more cowbell. <laughs> Wasn't that anthem glorious? Perfect for a text that talks about proclaiming God's glory among the nations. Amen. Thank you, choir, for such a wonderful witness and song today. I, in preparing the sermon today, began to ponder, what is the most devastating situation I've ever found myself in? And my mind took me back to a mission trip I took in 2005 with a college group. We went to Pass Christian, Mississippi to do hurricane recovery in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And I remember this trip vividly. This was one of the first opportunities that mission teams had to, to go into that place that had suffered such devastation because of the hurricane. And spring break was the perfect time for college students to go as they had the week to, to give. And I'll, I'll never forget, we were excited. Spring break is great, a break from classes, a break from studies, a time to, to go and to be rejuvenated. And so as we left College Station, where I was uh, in ministry at the time and made our trip east through Texas and through Louisiana, we were having a good time. Uh, our students were playing cards and singing songs and, and all of that on the trip as you do on a road trip. But I'll never forget, as we crossed over the border from Louisiana into Mississippi, and we turned right off of Interstate 10 and began the, the journey southward toward the coast, we began to see devastation all around us. There were whole fronts of apartment buildings just had deteriorated. There were bricks everywhere, brush and debris everywhere. There were cars that had been lifted by floodwaters up on to trees. And I noticed as we made our way further and further south, that murmur of singing and that loud talking, you know, when everybody's talking at once and they're excited, first faded to a dull whisper and then to complete silence as we began to take in everything that we were experiencing around us. We got all the way to the coast and took a left to go to the place where we were going to stay over the next few days, the home base for our work. And as we looked, water on our right, glacial, beautiful homes overlooking the water to our left, we saw more of what we had seen coming off the interstate 
Entire fronts of these homes completely ripped off and washed away, exposing chandeliers hanging from the ceiling within. Furnishings completely washed out somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. Just complete, abject, utter loss and devastation everywhere that you turned. Our home for that week was a supermarket parking lot that was closed even months after the hurricane had come and gone. The mission agency running the recovery effort called the site God's Katrina Kitchen because it was not only a place for missionaries who were going to work to begin restoring and repairing and making new that community that had suffered devastating loss, but it was a place that provided three meals a day for the residents of Past Christian, Mississippi. They could come and get breakfast, lunch, or dinner, but even more so, they could come to be fed by the Word of God. There was a morning devotional and prayer, and in the evening, there was a service of praise and service of the Word where people could be fed and nourished by the Word of God. That experience will always stick with me. The experience of singing praises to God right in the middle of utter and absolute destruction. Hope proclaimed in the midst of brokenness and loss. People who had lost everything they had on this earth, some of them who had lost people in the storm, came together and praised God. That is the picture of unshakable joy that we long for, that we proclaim, that we wait for during this Advent season. Joy is something far greater and deeper and grander than happiness. We seek happiness as a culture, but as Christians, we should seek joy to be rooted, grounded, and established in an unshakable joy. Because the reality of our lives is this, that the waters will rise, the winds will blow, things will not be as we have planned, but when we root ourselves upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, we place our faith and trust in Him alone, then what we build on that foundation will stand no matter what will come. If we build upon any other foundation, when trouble or brokenness or hardship come and begin to shake us, what's going to happen? Everything will collapse. I'll never forget the unshakable joy I experienced from the people of that community in the face of such loss and destruction. They continued to sing the Lord's song even in the midst of brokenness. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. And yes, if you're keeping track, and I've been impressed by how many people have noticed, we kicked off Advent here a week early. We did. The reason is the fourth Sunday of Advent is also Christmas Eve. And I just knew in the pit of my being that we needed a four full weeks of Advent, longing, hoping, waiting to prepare our hearts to receive the message and miracle of Christmas once again. I didn't want to rob us of a single week so that our celebration of Christmas will be joyous. I can't wait to celebrate Christmas on the 24th Sunday here with you all. The third Sunday of Advent has a nickname, Gaudet Sunday, and it comes from a Latin word meaning rejoice. And it's taken from Philippians 4, 4 through 7, which says, rejoice in the Lord, if you know it, Always, and for those who need us to say it louder in the back, again, I will say rejoice. rejoice. That's where the name comes from. And the tradition in some churches, we have four violet candles. That's right, too. But some churches have a different colored candle for the third Sunday of Advent. Anyone know what color that candle would be? Pink. Pink, I always wondered, why is it pink? It's pink because it's a brighter violet a more vibrant violet. It's so that our morning turns to joy. And so today we learn rejoicing in the midst of hardship and trouble and pain. Now, our text today, Isaiah 61, 
is said to be God's job description and mission statement for the renewal of the nations. Isn't that beautiful? This text has been called by some the Great Commission in Luke's Gospel. Because in Jesus' very first sermon, this is his text. It says in Luke 4, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he unrolled it to the place where it said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim that the time has come when God would save his people. Do you know the story from Luke? It says that all eyes were fixed upon Jesus, and he took the seat of the teacher, and he began his sermon with these words. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Pretty cool, right? The Great Commission. Here's what's so significant about this text. First of all, this was written during a time when the people of Israel were returning from exile in Babylon to a city and nation completely and utterly decimated by war. The temple no longer stood. Religious life had been left behind when they were taken into Babylon after the invasion that had happened years before. They faced years, decades of rebuilding. And here's the reality of rebuilding. We had experienced this in past Christian Mississippi as well. Without rebuilding your spiritual foundation in the face of devastating loss, there is no hope of rebuilding on the physical foundations around us. Have you been there before? When you are in the face of devastating loss and brokenness, you have to have your faith in Jesus Christ restored because only that foundation is solid and is the foundation upon which all restoration can be rebuilt. Isaiah was providing this job description, this mission statement of, of a spiritual life rebuilt, trust rebuilt in God as the foundation of all things. Without that, all of society would crater and crumble again. And so that's what happened. This text is all about salvation. And you notice that salvation isn't just about showing up an hour a week in this text, right? It's tangible. It, it has life. Salvation here is bringing good news to the oppressed. It's in binding up the brokenhearted. It's about proclaiming liberty to those who are captive. It's about prisoners being released. It's about the year of jubilee coming in all of its fullness. It's about those who are mourning, finding comfort, finding praise instead of a faint spirit. Mission, one commentator wrote, isn't just about sending money and missionaries somewhere else, but it's about engaging in this practical work daily in our own communities. I know we all, when we look around our city, our world, we see the oppressed, don't we? We can find the brokenhearted. We find those who are captive to sin or slaves to something. We find those who are in prison. We find those who are enslaved to debt that keeps their lives from moving forward. We find all around us people who are mourning. The very work of mission, grounded in this text in Jesus' first sermon in Luke's Gospel, is initiating these salvific acts. That's why ministries like Lifeline are so important. Serving our unhoused neighbors, providing tangible things, but providing hope, providing community, providing relationship. Our unhoused neighbors protect our building when we are not here. 
I have heard story upon story upon story of those who sleep on our porches who, when somebody's coming and causing a ruckus, calm the situation down. Some of our unhoused friends worship with us. They're a part of our congregation. Isn't that beautiful? That's a picture of, of this mission being fulfilled that Isaiah lifts up here. This week, the Western Church celebrated the feast day of St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas lived in the 300s. Legend has it that he went to study with the Desert Fathers in Egypt and was imprisoned because of his Christian faith and was released from prison when Constantine, the emperor of Rome, issued an edict that Christianity was going to be the official religion of the empire. St. Nicholas became bishop. He, it legend says, saved a father's daughters from going into slavery because the father didn't have the material resources to fund the dowry of his daughters. So the legend says that St. Nicholas threw money through the window into the home of this father, filling their shoes. And you see where the Christmas tradition was born, right? The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. There are children in other countries who await presents under their pillow. Sounds like somebody else who delivers things after teeth fall out, but that's a whole other deal. Uh, but St. Nicholas isn't just known for that. St. Nicholas is known for something else, which is why we're reciting the Nicene Creed during the season of Advent. Do you know what else he did? During the Council of Nicaea, from which the creed that we proclaimed earlier arose, there was a debate about the divinity of Jesus. And jolly old St. Nicholas, the same one that, you know, Santa Claus, all that came from, uh, is reported to have punched Arius in the face because of a disagreement over the divinity of Christ. It turns out lumps, too, were St. Nicholas's specialty. But he and his life lived this mission that Isaiah is raising up by bringing good news to those who are poor, to freeing people from oppression. That's a picture of what our lives are to be about, too. Now, here's the way this works. When we display this type of mission in our own lives, salvation lived, it proclaims something valuable to the world around us. Look at the picture that Isaiah lifts up. He says, those who have experienced this will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display His glory. My family and I love to hike, and when we lived in Austin, we would hike all the time. There are trails everywhere on the hills, and our favorite thing to do was to find a stream and to walk beside it, because the, just the sound of the water flowing over the rocks and down the little cascading waterfalls was relaxing and reorienting. And I remember one year in particular when we were there, it was a year of drought, and so the leaves had fallen off of many of the trees that were stressed, but those trees that were planted by the streams were taller and greener than everything else around. When you looked at the oak forest, you could look for the green canopy and find the nourishing waters. That's how it should be for Christians when the world looks upon us. In a dry and weary land where there is brokenness and destruction and drought all around, people should be drawn to the green canopy of our faith in order to find living water. That's what Isaiah is lifting up here. Your faith matters. The way you embody salvation in this way speaks a grand word to a world longing for hope and peace and joy and love. Here's what will happen when the people of faith live the mission of Jesus. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastation. They shall repair the ruined cities the devastation of many generations. I was struck on that mission trip to past Christian, Mississippi, that we didn't really do any reconstruction. We were still mucking and gutting. We were still cleaning up debris 
And that has to happen in people's lives before they can really rebuild upon their own spiritual foundation. You've got to clear the debris, clear out the clutter, clean up. Live lives free of sin and bondage and brokenness. We as Christians experience the jubilee talked about in this text. We have been freed from the debt owed by our sin. We have been given new life by our Savior. And in Jesus' name, we are raised from death to life. And we are oaks planted by the water, a green canopy for all to come and find the living water of our Lord. This passage ends with Gaudet, with rejoicing. It says, the result of all of this is, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for God has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. You know what that reminds me of? One of my very favorite hymns in all of our hymnal. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Well, know the words of that song? It's beautiful, and I want to end by sharing a few of those with you today. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Always giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us to the joy divine. Mortals, us, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. God's own love is reigning o'er us, binding all within its span. Ever singing, March we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. In the midst of brokenness, despair, and devastation, Christians sing songs of joy, which remind us that God is with us and that our hope in Him is unshakable. So in the midst of hardship and pain, all we need is more cowbell. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the unshakable joy that you give us when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to reestablish our foundation in him, his faith in you, his life lived in faith before you, seeing his mission through to death and resurrection. God, raise us to new life. Renew and transform our lives so that we can be like oaks planted by the water. And use us, Lord, to be a part of the rebuilding and the renewal of your city and the world. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is still teaching disciples to pray. As we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I've intentionally, with uh, Terry's help, have programmed music that doesn't quite put Jesus in the manger, uh, so that we cultivate the practice of waiting. Well, now our music begins to move us closer to Bethlehem, closer to the miracle of Christmas. And so if you need to draw near to Jesus during this closing song, I invite you to come and pray at these rails as we sing our closing song together. It came upon the midnight clear, won't you?
forth to share the unshakable joy with the world that we encounter. I want to share a few ways that you can step forward in faith and share in that joy. It was exciting this morning to walk in and just see the overwhelming amount of presents that y'all have donated for the Magi Tree. Thank you for your kind and, gener and generous spirits. We also have our online Magi Tree, and we encourage you, if you haven't had an opportunity to join in that uh, effort of sharing unshakable joy, to know that you can go online and do that at FM Houston. Also, we have our NIA tamale sale. This is the last day to get those. It's a delicious opportunity to share joy around a table with friends and family in the days ahead, and they will be delivered here next week, so it's a great opportunity to do that. Also, today is the last day to purchase your Christmas poinsettia in memory or honor of a loved one. We encourage you to do that as well. And then don't forget this week we have our NIA and, uh, NIA families and Lifeline Christmas parties. There's great ways to come and be a part of sharing that joy. We encourage you to check out the newsletter for all of those details. I want to share a picture with you. One of the funniest Christmas songs out there to me is The Little Drummer Boy. And this is why. And I read something that brought it all together for me. You know, somewhere, sometime, someone decided, you know what this tired new mother needs? as her baby has just gotten to sleep? A drum solo. <laughs> but perhaps that reminds us of the unshakable joy we have in the Lord. In the face of brokenness, despair, mourning, pain, destruction, what it calls for is more cowbell. <laughs> so sing songs, joyful songs to the Lord in the midst of hardship and struggle and pain. Be an oak of righteousness planted beside streams of water that draw others to the living water of our Lord by your green canopy. Go forth today and every day and be the church. Amen. <laughs> 